Fantastic. Hi, uh, my name is Eric Munson, and I'm a PhD student at BU and a Red Hat research intern, and I'm here to talk to you about ukulele, or restructuring event handling in UKL. So we're going to start a bit by introducing the team. Um, there's myself, of course, and then two fellow students, Aisha Neem and Vance Raidi. And then I'd like to thank our Red Hat mentor, Richard Jones, and then our uh, advisors, our academic advisors, Jonathan Apavu, Angela Dimke brown and Aron Krieger. So before we get into what UK ukulele is, let's talk a little bit about where it was built. Um, so UKL, for anyone who did not make it to the, uh, the DevConf talk last year, is a selection of patches to the Linux kernel and to glibc that allow you to take a privileged application and link the application text with the kernel text itself into a single binary, boot that as if it were unikernel-like, and then run that single privileged application in supervisor mode with full access to the internal uh, the kernel internal API. Um, but that's not all that it does, right? It, it, it provides the ability to access that internal API. So we've demonstrated some really significant speed ups, about 22% for if you're willing to really reach into the guts of things on some of the key value stores that we tested. But also, you don't have to give up user space. So if you want to measure your performance with perf, if you want to debug with GDB, if you want to set up other applications to do things like logging or key rotation, all of that is also supported as a, as a standard uh, Unix or Linux user space. OK, so let's introduce the problem a little bit. We're talking about event handling and event structures in modern, uh, modern applications. What do we mean by that? Well, a modern application is often broken up into a bunch of small microservices. So what we think of as a big business application is broken up into a bunch of little microservices that are each going to be running independently right, on a, one or more servers within a data center. So instead of having a, you know, a large application with libraries that it calls to, you're going to break things up and spread them out. And which is great for things like reliability um, and, uh, and fault isolation. But you, uh, and you, you take this and you, you wrap it in a REST API. I'm sorry, I missed that little bit there. Um, so you're providing with a network interface, you can talk to it from almost anywhere. So like I said, this is great for fault isolation and for application isolation. But it introduces more sources of latency now because you don't just have your application execution which is always going to happen. You can't get rid of that one. We've actually added this new source of latency, communications. So instead of making direct procedure calls due with the library, now you have to invoke uh, network, uh, some sort of network protocol to communicate with another server, to make a request, to wait for the response, to come back. All of this adds to, uh, up to a lot of variability in your application performance, something that you maybe don't have the greatest control of with the APIs that are currently provided. So, but the key here is going to be, because we're basing everything on communications, we build our application around an event loop. What the heck is that thing? OK. An event loop in uh, systems level programming is really actually pretty simple. You have an API for constructing a list of events that interest you. Typically, these are I.O. related events. They don't have to be, but we're going to talk about the I.O. ones because those are the most interesting for this particular project. Um, you would construct a list of I.O. events when streams are readable, when streams are writable, and then communicate that list to the kernel somehow through some API that's provided. And then you tell the, the operating system, once you've provided that list, OK, I want to wait for one or more of these things to happen. And you are, at that point, descheduled, so taken off of the a running CPU, put in a state where you're asleep, and you're waiting for something to happen. When something happens, the kernel wakes you up, puts you back in, into the runnable state, and you return from this call that you made saying, I want to wait for events, with a list of what has happened while you were asleep. That's it, that's the loop, rinse and repeat. Okay, great, so we have the event loop. But what, we talked a little bit about variability of communication when we had in there. So we're gonna talk about this graph in specific in just a second, but that communication variability has a number of factors. It can be scheduling latency, maybe there's a lot of stuff going on in the system and so when you were woken up, the time between you when you were woken up and when you were actually scheduled on a CPU, that's part of latency. Can also be um, actually uh, contending with other memory management on the system. So that maybe when you called read and you needed to copy data back out of that, memory management had to get involved. Um, uh, you also have problems with locality. Packet arrives on CPU one, you're running on CPU six. It's not anywhere in your cache, so you have to bring all of that packet data into your local cache before you can process. 
So let's talk a little bit about this picture now. What we have here is a histogram, and this histogram is of latencies between when the operating system itself was aware that it was going to wake a process waiting on an I.O. event, and when that process actually got to executing the I.O. So more specifically, this was taken with a Redis application where the initial timestamp was taken right before the kernel calls try to wake up on the Redis process because it's aware that the Redis process is waiting on a socket. And then that Redis process, call, the end timestamp was taken right before the Redis process executed read. So a lot happened in that window, right? We recognized that there was I.O. destined for a socket of interest. We woke a process. We waited for the scheduler to schedule that process. The process returned from ePoll or, or select or whatever interface it was using with a list of events, processed that list of events by iterating through it and deciding what to do at every step, right? And then finally, finally we get to the read. Now, about this graph, I want you to notice a few things. First and foremost, the y-axis is in log scale. It's done that way just so that you can actually see the cluster that's out there on the right-hand side. Because if we do it in, 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 uh, in normal scale or in, in uh, non-log scale, those just disappear. And so you see a really big graph with that same peak on the left-hand side, but nothing on the right. The left-hand side is cool. It's great. It's about 90, I think it was 92% of our, ex of our uh, requests in this stayed within that big, that big loop over there, that big lump over there. But about 8% took two orders of magnitude longer to complete. And this is just before we have even read the data. We haven't done any processing. We haven't written any responses. This is just the amount of time it took to decide what we were going to do and start to do it. So when you have that kind of long tail latency, that starts to impact SLAs because your microservice is one in a chain of many microservices. Every time a microservice gets out on that end of the tail, You've added to latency, and your overall application performance is going to suffer greatly for it, and your customers are not going to be happy. So what have other APIs done about this, right? We, we aren't using the same interfaces for event programming that we have that we were in the 70s. What has, how has POSIX evolved, or POSIX Plus evolved, to, to meet these sorts of problems? Well, in the Linux world, ePoll and Poll before it were attempts to try and improve the event management side of things. So with select, you had to communicate your events of interest every time you made a select call. So every time you wanted to go to sleep, you had to tell the kernel about every event that you were interested in. That, that's really inefficient because it's lots of boundary crossings between user space and kernel, and lots of, more specifically, memory copies between the two, while you marshaled up the events you cared about and then unmarshaled them on the other side and did the registration for them. ePoll simplified this a great deal by saying, you tell me about the events you care about, and I'll hold on to that list. You can modify it over time, but then you just have to tell me, give, this is the list I care about. I want to wait till something happens. So that's wonderful for the event communication side of things, but ePoll and Select are exactly the same on the back end. From wake up to, to what we do on the way out of the system call when an event has happened, the format of, of the communication is different but it's the same idea. It's exactly the same idea. You go to sleep, you wake up, you get a list of events, you unmarshal that list of events, you process them, and then you, uh, you execute whatever you found. Okay, so that's the Linux world. In, uh, in BSD, we have the notion of KQs, which take the idea from ePoll saying, I really want to be able to have this list, but also I want to add one more degree of freedom. I want to be able to specify some of these events are high priority or low priority and have you make scheduling decisions based on that. So if I get a high priority event, I want you to, to actually communicate with that with a scheduler and say the, the thread handling this event is really important and should be bumped up in priority and hit the, hit the CPU sooner, please. And then finally, you see a lot of talk about bypass. In this, in this case, what I mean is network bypass. It, all the cool kids are moving networking stacks up in, out of operating systems and into user space, writing their own. I mean, that, I guess that's a great idea. I don't know. I'm an operating system guy, so I tend to look down on, on bypass. I love operating systems. That's what I want to do. But really, it comes with some pretty significant downsides. You're writing your own TCP stack or you're using somebody else's, but it probably hasn't seen the testing and the overall coverage that, the, that a more well-tested one like Linux or BSD's networking stack has seen. So right there, you're, you're sort of setting yourself at a bit of a disadvantage. On top of that, you, you give up the ability to be event-driven. In order to do user space bypass, 
and I don't know if this is 100% true, but for all the systems I've seen, you have to dedicate a CPU to polling on the receive queue that you've taken over. No more interrupt driven. You can't be woken up. You have to have this CPU polling, which is not great for power and not great for, for the ability to schedule. On top of all that, so we just talked about the event subscription model. We haven't talked anything about concurrency and locality, right? The POSIX model, it sort of leaves this up as an exercise for the reader, and that's, that's true of, uh, of, of no matter which interface you're using, right? So you have to care about what my concurrency needs and build the threads for that, and then even harder, you have to care about how important is locality? How important is that cache locality for me in my performance? And if, it, if you care about it, you really only have some pretty aggressive hammers for it, right? Your events are managed on streams, and your execution contexts are managed as threads. And so if you really care about ensuring that one thread is responsible for one connection and runs on one CPU, you have to bind the CPU to, to a, the thread to a CPU, and then you have to make sure you're using something like flow steering on the, at the, the driver level to ensure that the receive queues for that CPU always get packets for that flow. Okay, so great, we sort of have, have addressed the problem, but what happens if we have some sort of really unfortunate outcome with the hashing and the flow steering algorithm, and now everything in my application is doing is being funneled through a single CPU, and I have seven idle ones sitting there, and one of them that's overloaded and can't keep up. Redistribution of load in this model is very, very difficult. So we talked about locality. What about concurrency? Well, poll and epoll don't even attempt to, to solve this. It's entirely left up as an exercise to the user. Um, modern applications have taken several different approaches to it. You can do something like have a single event loop, which then dispatches work to other worker threads. You can dispatch connections to threads so that each thread owns its own and has its own event loop. I mean, really, there's, there's arguments to be made in favor of any of these different models, depending on what you need to do, but they're entirely ignored by the event handling mechanism. KQs does a little bit better, as well as being able to provide the, the priority of the event that you've given, so that you give some hints to scheduler about when you should run. You're also allowed to ensure that events are routed as to specific, uh, specific um, threads when they wake up. And this is without ensuring that you have to take the entire stream and assign it to a thread. You can simply say the events from this particular connection are need to be routed to that thread at this point. And you can change the decisions without handing the stream back and forth. So that's a really good step in the right direction. And again, with bypass, you have a bucket of blocks. You get to build whatever it is you want, but you have to build whatever that is. Okay, how does an OS do this? Surely they can't have the same primitives that we're using in user space, and it turns out they don't. So the pole-like interface that we have is actually a natural um, outcome of, using, of building a layered system and ins insisting on maintaining that layered structure. And now while the layered structure can do things for you when you are building systems and help you maintain the organization of those systems, you as with anything, when you commit too hard to that one idea, you can paint yourself into corners when you have a situation that doesn't actually fit that mold particularly well. And in, 80, in 1985, Clark showed that there are cases where you really should be able to allow lower level layers to invoke services from higher levels. And this actually kept with your, your, your overall structuring, but led to significant performance improvements and uh, system reliability. So the operating system actually uses, works with the hardware using interrupt tables or vectors to do uh, event management. Let's talk a little bit about what those are because this idea is going to be pretty important. An interrupt table or a vector is a way for you to register a piece of code to be exe uh, executed in response to an incoming event, right? Now, I know there's a lot of hand-waving there and I'm not going to go into architectural details about anything, but the notion of assigning code to be run at an event is the key idea here. The other bit that we're not really gonna talk about is execution environments. I'm not gonna go into details about how the OS constructs execution environments for event handling, but just note that we have three key pieces here. We have subscription to an event, code that should be run in response, and an execution environment for that code to be run in. 
right? Okay. So let's talk a little bit about ukulele's design. So at the core of ukulele, we have the, we're, the event queue. And the event queue is where we express our locality. So you can express locality here with three options that we provide, though more could be, uh, could be easily added. The easiest one being, I have one event queue for the entire system. Locality doesn't matter to me, or I'm porting a single threaded system, and this is the easiest way for me to make a jump into that, uh, this new event handling model. So I only want one work queue. Going to a little bit more fine grain, option B is that you can build a work queue per last level task. So modern processors, like from AMD, have clusters of cores on a socket that share a last level task with equal access for all of those cores to that last level task. So if that's the, the, the kind of locality you care about, you only care about last level cache locality, you can build a work queue that only maps one of those. Finally, you can build a work queue for every CPU and saying locality is primary, I really need to care about this. So once you've instantiated work queues, the application is going to provide those execution contexts we talk about. In this case, they're simply POSIX threads. You create however many POSIX threads, you do whatever management you want for execution environments, specifically, you bind them so that they run within whatever work queues are assigned to them. If it's a system-wide one, you don't need to do anything, the scheduler's in place. If it's the last level cache one, then you want to ensure that your event handlers only run on CPUs on that last level cache, and if it's per CPU, you bind to the specific CPU that you're running, where you're gonna be running. The key here is you need to have at least one execution context per work queue. Once you've done all your setup, over on the right-hand side, you're gonna communicate your interest in events to the kernel. So rather than providing a list of things that I care about and getting a list of things that, need to, that I need to parse on return, and this is gonna be a key thing we're gonna show in a second, I'm just going to take the idea of up calls and interrupt tables and say, I know what needs to happen. When I create uh, interest in a socket using ePoll saying, I wanna know when this socket becomes readable. I know what's going to happen already when that socket becomes readable. There's really no reason for me to go through these, these steps of unmarshalling and parsing an event list so that I can direct my code. I knew what was gonna happen in the first place. Why can't I just jump straight into it? And that's what we're going to do here. We're going to register a function that handles what I do in response to this event, and it takes an optional argument that you can pass in much like pthread create does, you give it an opaque pointer and it hands that to you when it executes the code in response to an event. So you should be good to go without doing any of the parsing. Okay, so now with the full system, when a packet arrives, it's added to the receive queues, parsed by the, the networking stacks, and we get to the point where we know a socket is ready to be read. At this point, we're using this, just like poll and select, we're using the same backend for, for wakeups. We're notified, we register our interest, and we notified. But instead of waking up a process to then return from the system call and parse our events, we wake an execution context. That execution context inspects its own work queue, the one that to which it's assigned, extracts the first waiting event from that, and executes, jumps straight into the function pointer with the argument. No extra processing required. Just go do the thing that you needed to do in response to this event. And then it will continually check as it's running to see if there are more things to be run, and when there's not, it puts itself to sleep. The model here is very much like the kernel work you, worker threads um, internal to the kernel itself. You do work when there's work to be done, you put yourself to sleep when there's, when there's not. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about what that means for concurrency and locality. What we've constructed here gives you the ability to do locality-aware event dispatch. So if you really care about locality in that cache, or, or uh, not just the last level, but all the way down to the, the lower level caches, then you can say, I want you to have an, a, an event queue per thread, or per CPU, and I only want to handle events that come in for this, this particular C on this particular CPU here. I don't want to do cross-processor uh, cross wake-ups. I don't want to have to do cross-processor cache invalidations, et cetera. I really care about happening, this happening right here. But that locality control is completely independent. So we've separated the concerns of locality control and concurrency. You're free to, to, to include as many execution contexts per work queue as you like, depending on what you think your overall needs are going to be, as long as you have one. It doesn't make sense to have an event queue with nobody there to do the work. So what does this actually look like in terms of results? So the team ported Redis, and we started with Redis because it was simple. Um, 
to this new event handling mechanism. Now remember earlier I said we have uh, work queues where you could say I want one work queue for the whole system to aid in porting. This was the, work, the, the, the use case we had in mind. Redis is notoriously single threaded. And so we didn't want to break that assumption. And so we created a single work queue and a single event worker thread so that we could ensure that only that one thread ever was touching the data store at any point. That we never, we never had to worry about concurrent access. So what you'll see here is the plot of latency in milliseconds of Redis requests. So this is a full end-to-end -end request now as measured by the MIM tier benchmark. And then the, the percentile of, of, uh, for, uh, uh, for the, the, the handling on the x-axis. So it's a plot of, of, uh, of, of, of percentile to, to latency here. And the shape that I want to call out here and what this actually is showing is that we basically took the same curve and just dropped it. We did everything that Redis was doing faster. And the reason we did that, the way that we did that, is by bypassing the marshalling and unmarshalling of events in and out of the system. What this is showing is that jumping straight into the handler saves you work. I mean, that's sure, you could say, well, duh. But this is actually a measurement of the work that we saved. When we threw out parsing the return structure, we get a significant improvement on latency throughout the entire curve. Now, we didn't expect, and we didn't, do anything about the right-hand side of that curve, right? And the belief that, that we have and that we're going to be showing with future experiments is that's largely tied to the locality side of our problem, which is really hard to express when you are single-threaded. It's really tough for me to say, I want one CPU to be local, or one thread to be local to this CPU and that CPU and the other CPU over there. It's just not a thing that we really can do. <clears throat> so we want to quantify how hard was this to actually do? Like how hard is this model to wrap your head around? And that's unfortunately kind of a difficult thing to talk about from a developer's perspective, especially as we are the ones developing the system. So of course it feels natural to us, like this wouldn't be all that hard to port to. I mean, in terms of lines of code, this was 140 lines of code more than the, the UKL port to base model initially. So really not that much line of code, uh, not that many lines of code, but the real difficulty is in changing the way you think about your ac application's execution. Because we have separated concurrency, locality, and event execution, you, you, you can't make some of the assumptions that were initially being made by people who, or by developers who were assigning, say, streams to threads to CPUs. Right, you really do have to think about this could be executing almost anywhere, and there could possibly be event handling in parallel. So we really have to consider that. So that, and that's, that's, it's very difficult to quantify what kind of developer effort that actually entails. We had hoped, but didn't quite make to, having memcached results here. But I do want to talk about some of the difficulty and where that's going and what, what's actually taking the time here. So, Memcached is structured in such a way that concurrency and event handling and memory management are all tightly integrated. Every worker thread owns its own event queue, owns a set of connections which, re are, which represent streams. They are an object built around a file descriptor. And all of their, uh, their memory management is done with that connection. So they're maintaining their ability to stay lock free for a lot of their transaction by ensuring that you never move a connection between threads and that no two threads are ever touching the same connection at the same time. So the only locking necessary is your backing data store for when you're actually interacting with, with things that you're holding onto in the data store. Um, but the complication there is we want to replace the event in, the interface entirely. And so that means we have to think real hard about restructuring the other two. So we have a number of ideas that we're pursuing on how we can maintain the locality of memory management so that we don't have to introduce locks around the allocator, and, but still be able to hand events across so that we can redistribute load when a CPU gets overburdened and other packets start picking up the, the received queues or events off of the received queues. Finally, when we do get the memcached experiment running, between that experiment and the Redis slash KeyVal experiment that we show, we will easily be able to quantify the amount of work done by just marshaling and unmarshaling event data, and also the impact of locality on your ability to handle events within your, your time constraints. So where are we going from here? What's the future look like? Well, the immediate future is we need, we're putting together a paper. 
And these are the things that are going to end up in the paper. The memcached DE port is important because it's going to allow us to quantify the things that we're studying, specifically the impact of our event system and the impact of locality on event processing. A couple of the ideas we have for pushing further are, we talk a lot about zero copy IO, zero copy read, zero copy write. In the UKL context, zero copy read isn't that hard because you're not crossing a protection boundary. So we really should just be able to hand you back a pointer to a kernel buffer and say, here, your data is right there. Go ahead and read it. You don't need to copy it across the, the protection boundary. But what if we didn't need to make the read call at all? What if one of the things that, that ukulele provided you when it woke you up with an event is here is the buffer where the data you want is stored. Go ahead and process that. So we're going to explore the idea of, of perhaps adding that to the argument structure and providing you without, without the, the need to, or bypassing the need to call read at all. Um, we, want, we want to explore the idea that accept does not need to be special, right? Often modern applications will put accept in its own event loop run in a single thread, usually the first one that starts, and then it delegates connections that are established once they are. But accept itself is, protects against multiple reads, so you're not going to get the same connection. If two threads enter accept on the same socket, they're not going to get the same connection on the, on the back end. So do we really need to ensure that this is part of a single thread, or can we spread that load out and perhaps see some wins in a connection establishment and therefore overall latency? Um, we'd like to explore whether the idea of zero copyright is as performant as, as people make it out to be. And then finally, Ukulele was supposed to be a clever acronym, but we're missing the, the back half of it, so we really need to come up with a clever finish to that acronym because it, the name's got to stick. So in conclusion, we're offering an alternative for event management and event-driven programming. Specifically, we're offering new primitives that allow you to express your needs of locality, your needs of concurrency, and the events themselves independently of each other. We demonstrate that our model is moderately more performant in throughput and latency. Um, and we show some gains and so that, this, that allow us to quantify the cost of doing that event unpacking in the event loop. But we really anticipate this uh, event model shining when we're allowed to fully use the parallelism, the parallelism of the system. So when we finally get memcached ported over to make heavy use of locality and, and, and load distribution, that's where we really expect to see our wins, and we expect to see the right-hand tail on latency come down. Do we have any questions? <laughs> So, yeah. No, just uh, do you envision, is there an application or some real world use cases where you see, oh, this would benefit from this a lot? So when I started this research, the whole thing that put me down this path was learning to do asynchronous programming in Python, and I hate it. I hate it. Like, expressing asynchronous programming in Python is a pain. But I think, I think that that's because of the primitives upon which it's built. Right? I think the ePoll interface is what forces that ugly model in, in Python. And so my hope is, and we'll see if, uh, if my advisor and Red Hat agree, that expanding this model out into higher level language runtimes is really where we're going to see that benefit. But ultimately, this could be used by anything that's driven by an event loop. Right? Any modern microservice should be able to do that. Um, that web servers would be the nat next natural port, I think. I don't know if I fully followed why you didn't see any additional improvement on the right-hand side mm -hmm. of the um, Redis port. I, I heard you say sort of locality, but uh -huh. I also got the impression it was running using that single. Oh, it was. Wh why can't it be adapted to use the one, the one CPU binding approach? Because we have. Well, I mean, it, it could. You yeah. could theoretically take all of the 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 connections that Redis is going to get and funnel them down through a single CPU. Right. Right. I, we just didn't. We didn't set up a, a, the flow steering and pinning okay. for it. What would you expect? Um, I would expect slightly tighter latencies on the uh, on the right hand side. I wouldn't expect. I would expect not to have the massive spikes because when you when you combine, if you get the perfect storm of cache misses, inter process interrupts, and you're not the most important thing to run on the target <laughs> CPU, 
you see some pretty pretty heinous um, latency results. We're seeing 10, 15 milliseconds of request in the worst case. So. Cool. Thanks very much.